All right. Um, so, Pastor Dusty and I sat down um, many moons ago and talked about uh, the series that we would do in October called Monsters. This is my second year to do uh, this series, and I think it is helpful. And so we sat down and put these topics out months ago. So it, the, the thing about doing uh, a topical study or a word study is somebody always thinks that I'm preaching to them. I don't do that. Uh, I would be run out of town very quickly if I did that. So we're going to talk about something that everyone deals with today, so I'm not reading your emails, okay? Uh, but there is a monster that will consume you if you will allow it. Um, and many of you, it, it, is, it is the driving force in your life, if we will be honest. Um, and it can be. It is never simple, but it can be dealt with in a godly manner that is so much better than the way that we innately deal with it. Uh, and that is conflict. Or as you like to say, people. <laughs> I don't like to say people. I've heard that in my whole life. Well, that's just people and people are stupid. Well, what are you? What an arrogant statement to, to act like you've never been the problem. So I like to just say conflict because this is, this is the human condition and we are all subject to it. And if we want to point at the problem, generally it's no farther than ourselves. But, but this is multifaceted. Uh, I don't have a lot of props on the stage. I have a lot of scripture to cover. I would really like you to write down some notes today. Uh, I, I pretty well guarantee if I, if I made a bet with everyone, like a dollar, if this applies to you, and if it doesn't, I'll give you 50. I would still come out with more money today, okay? So this is going to apply to everyone. So I really highly, highly recommend you uh, using your connection card and, and taking out a pen and writing down some scripture. I'm going to give you a lot of it today. In fact, I added some scripture this morning, and so although the scripture will be on the screen, uh, I did add a few verses that will not be on the screen. So heads up back there on the computer. Not everything uh, is, is on there. But I smiled when I said it, so you can't be mad at me. <laughs> Conflict, that's right. That's right. Stand up back there, and I don't want conflict with these people. Y'all stand up back there in the sound booth. Everybody stand up. How about a hand for our volunteers? Yeah. Thomas is so tall that he was down there on the steps and still taller than them. We already thought he was standing up. Okay. I don't want conflict with them. I will lose that. Okay. How do we deal with conflict. Let's get cracking in Matthew. That's in the New Testament. You have a Bible, and if you don't, it is our joy, honor, nay, our privilege to give you a Bible. Out, uh, outside, just right by the pumpkin smash sign up, we have Bibles. Please take one. It's our, it, it really are. We're, we're thrilled for you to take one. But it is a small library of books, 66 books. The first 39 books of the Old Testament the New Testament is when Jesus or the Messiah comes and he changes from the Old Testament, Old Covenant, Old Law to the New Law of Love and Grace. And uh, that first book of the New Testament is Matthew. Listen to Matthew chapter 18. You've possibly never heard this unless you've heard, uh, unless you've heard me teach on it. Um, so I, I really want you to take note here. Okay, Matthew 18, verse 15 through 17. Let's just jump right in. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. It just got deep already. Okay? Just, man, just, just keep it in the house. If your brother sins against you, and remember, just like if, if you speak Spanish, there's a masculine and a feminine uh, 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 form to, to words, and so when I speak in plurality, I use the masculine form. So when your brother sins against you, it could be a woman as well, okay? If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. Why? Wouldn't you want somebody to do that for you? That, like, 
this is going to squelch so much if you will just keep it in-house and go straight to somebody instead of taking the long way around. This is going to help so much. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. All right? So step one, brother sins against you. Go straight to your brother and say, we have a problem. If you will go in humility, if you will go in humility, this is generally where it ends. If you will go in humility. If you come in hot, things are going to heat up. Okay? If I come into the fire with gasoline, well, what do you think is going to happen? If I go in with humility, but I'm justified. Listen, if we start talking about justified anger, God's going to hit you with lightning on the way out the doors today. Okay? So, and, and me. And me. Okay. But if he won't listen, because that's what you were thinking initially. <laughs> I've done that. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. Okay? So this is the church. This is why the church helps. This is why, uh, this is why they had men at the gate in the old days. This is why we have people of, of wisdom. This is why literally in, th- this is one of the reasons that America was fighting the British because we wanted to go to court with our peers. We wanted someone trustworthy that understood our people, our culture, our religion to be able to judge between me and you. I want somebody to handle this in a fair manner. And so this is where really, man, you need Christians in your life and say, I go to my brother and I say, you have, you have done this, man. We've got to resolve this. And they say, I haven't done a thing wrong. And this is where we seek wise counsel and go, am I crazy? And then so we take this not to court, but we take this in front of wisdom, and the church goes with uh, one or two others. Why one or two others? <laughs> yeah, because I don't want this to become a, a public opinion thing. Why? For you. Yes, you harm me. You sinned against me. I know I've done the same thing. I'm not trying to bash you. I'm not trying to drag you through the mud. We're going to keep this in house. You didn't believe me when I went to you. I want to hear it from. I want you to hear from some more people that you trust. Okay. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. Now this is interesting. Wouldn't that be a fun hour? Hey, everybody, come up who's had a grievance. Who you know, if you've gone to your brother and then you took some others. Come on up and share your drama. How would that be for a church service? Man. True. We'd get a lot of hits, wouldn't we? Okay. That's not the point. In fact, think about this. Who is the church? Oh, I mean, we have, we have friends in India that we're supporting, don't we? They're the church, too. Do we need to call and tell them about it? What about the ones in Russia and Africa and Australia? What about all the church? Does every single person in here need to know? No, I need to tell the church. And, and that kind of means that you need to tell me or you need to tell Pastor Dusty. You need to tell uh, the church. We've got, man, we've got this guy who's in sin. And some of y'all, I stepped up and you're like, man, we want to hear more of Royce. And all you've got to do is get a deep WI. You'll get in the slammer and you'll hear him every Sunday, okay? Royce goes, <laughs> Royce goes, Royce is preaching at the jail every Sunday, and, uh, and, and you can hear him there. So I'm going to use him as an example because he is a model citizen, and you know that this is all fictitious. But if, if uh, Royce has been going over and slapping your mama once every week, and, and you go to Royce and he's like, I'm not doing a thing wrong. I am justified. She is a terrible person. And so I have every right to slap her once a week. And, and you come to me and you're like, man, he is... He, he's a mom slapper. Like, he, he can't be preaching, right? So you go to him, and you say, Royce, you can't be slapping people's mama. And then and Royce says, I'm not doing anything wrong. And so you come back, and you, and, and, and you, you, you get somebody else, and you all, you all go, and Royce, you can't be doing this. And he says, I'm not doing it. Then you need to come to me and say, man, I don't know that, I don't know that he's your guy to be preaching. He's doing some terrible stuff. And so really it begins to stop there. And we say, Royce, you know what, man? You can't, you're, you're not, 
you're not, because if you're a minister, you're held at a different standard. So this is kind of a different, uh, maybe, a, maybe a bad scenario. I, it, look, look, it just came. It just came to me. Okay? But we say, Royce, man, you know what? You don't, you, if you're not going to follow the teachings of Jesus yourself, you don't need to be going around preaching this. And, and really, I think that's what we're talking about. It doesn't need to be a public announcement. You don't need to bring your bullhorn in to the church. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so we're not, we're not just adding gasoline to a fire. We are dealing with things for a reason, okay? Because I want to be able to, it, it says, uh, let him be like a Gentile or a tax collector to you. Well, what is that? That's somebody that I don't believe knows the, the Lord as their Savior, okay? This, remember, this is written in a Jewish context, and they're tax collectors. It wasn't like you being fired up about the IRS, Okay, tax collectors were actually uh, Jewish people who were working for the Romans who had betrayed their brothers and sisters and were coming in and charging more than they were supposed to charge so that they could benefit from it. It was a really, really evil, evil thing. Uh, So they're saying, man, we're going to treat them like people who don't know Jesus. What do we do to people who don't know Jesus? We try to lead them to Jesus. Okay, so this is not uh, we kick them out because we're better than you. We say, listen, by the way that by the way that you're acting, man, you, there's something in me that won't allow me to do that, and I want you to have that. And so that's why uh, it, it says, if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a gentile or a tax collector to you. So I'll pray for you, but I don't condone what you're doing. Make sense? And also, does it just have to be once? When we read this scripture, okay, first I go to myself, then I go to him with a couple more, and then I tell the church, boom, one, two, three, strike three, you're out. I don't know that it has to be that way. Man, there are times when I go to somebody, and then I have to go to them again in humility. And I don't know how many times that happens before I'm, I'm, I'm letting the Lord allow and the Lord lead me to go with that second or third person. And then that rarely ever has to happen if you have humility in mind, and also if you go with the right intentions. Well, what is that? Well, what are God's intentions for you? They are your restoration, not revenge. Okay? So if I go to you with revenge in mind, I'm going to you with gasoline. If I go to you with restoration in mind, I go to you with water. It's the same motion. (laughs) It's a highly different result. Does this make sense? It's the same motion, but it is a highly different result. What? is the end goal. Restoration. Why? Because that's what Jesus has for you. So this passage is not a license to gossip. It is not a license to destroy people. It is, it is a command that our Father has to love Him and to love people. And so how do I treat you with love? I throw water on this fire, not gasoline. Listen, listen to Proverbs 26, 20. Again, possibly one not on there, but I want you to write this down, Proverbs 26, 20. In fact, the entire chapter of Proverbs, chapter 26, is going to deal largely with conflict. Without wood, fire goes out. Without a gossip, conflict dies down. Bro, is that not good? Is that not just like, woo, yeah, that's simple. But whoo, is it tough? Because I get fired up. Man, we get fired fired up and then the phone comes out did God not work for your restoration so this is my goal so my goal is for restoration it should be I'm going to give you another passage really important also found in Matthew chapter 18 just a few verses down from the passage that we just read and uh, like this is one of those where you go "All right, Jesus take it easy So this is a perspective for us. This is, again, not me hitting you over the head with the Word of God. This is me helping you because I know that you say, I want to be an ambassador for Jesus. I want to handle things the right way. Okay, well, this is the perspective that you have to look at things with. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven And that's rough. And there's a reason he's using those numbers. He's basically saying, (laughs) yeah, I want you to forgive them as often as I have forgiven you. And how much is that? Like 70 times 7, probably just getting us started. That probably gets me through kindergarten. 
This is the point. At no point are you supposed to stop this. Why? Because God is my model for this, my model for restoring people, and I did not respond to the gospel without being forgiven way more than I deserve already. Mark Twain said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts I do understand that bother me. And this is one of those parts. This is something difficult he's asking us to do. He's asking us to do. This is me, uh, uh, in, in a sense, prophetically giving you the Word of God. I'm not asking you to do this. I have no authority to ask you to do the things that we're talking about today. But Jesus is. Keep that in mind so that you don't throw things at me. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. Before we go to verse 26, I, I, just, I, I want to break from that and I want to explain something to you. Because it seems like this is a, uh, something that keeps coming up in the Bible. We talk about uh, your master or someone being a slave. And I've told you, uh, this is not always the same as what you know of as slavery. Because today's slavery, uh, we are, and I'm, I'm going to give you the stereotypical parts of slavery that we have today. We will uh, import people illegally on a boat from uh, from a country where their lives are just horrible, mostly from that 1030 window somewhere in Asia, whatever. And so we bring them in, and they work in a factory, and you say, you know what, I'm going to bring you into freedom, but you're going to have to work for me to pay off that freedom. And guess what? It's never paid off. And so they end up working seven days a week, 12-hour days, until the day they die, and that is the world's new form of slavery. It's horrible. Uh, also, we have uh, sex slavery. And where, you know, we talked about this last week, somewhere between, uh, you know, depending on where you go, uh, their bodies can withstand for about six months. Uh, some, will, some will live up to about uh, seven years, uh, but they are just, you know, drug shoved in their face and have men forced on them on a, on a daily basis. And that is what we know of as slavery. And so when we hear it in the Bible, we're like, God, how does this, wow, why, man, flood it again, I'll die too, like I don't care. This has to stop. This wasn't what they're talking about. And you see where in this passage there's a master and someone owes him money. And so we have, like in, in our minds, we've been watching Disney and we're like, what you do if your son is at home crying all alone on the bedroom floor because he's hungry? You know, y'all know? Some of y'all are too young for that. <laughs> like we have this good family that... <laughs> That is, that is trying and just can't make it. But these were people who were uh, maybe squandering wealth and they had done something and they owed money and they couldn't pay it back. And so we say, okay, so now we take them as essentially a slave to pay off their debt. Now, the Old Testament had the year of Jubilee. And so if I, if I took your land from you or if I took you in as a servant, every time the year of Jubilee came around, you were released. Or maybe when your debt was paid off to me, you were released. So, uh, so I'll use my daughter. J.D. owes me money and she uh, won't pay me back. And so uh, I owe Charlie and I won't pay Charlie back. And so I might just say, look, I don't... I'm going to take her as a slave, and you go work for Charlie, and she'll pay off that debt. And when she's done, boom, everybody's good. Does that make sense? So that's sort of what we're talking about. We weren't normally always talking about someone innocent who was just taken from their homeland and brought into slavery for the rest of their life. Is that okay? I just wanted to clear that up because some of you are like, this, I just can't believe God would condone these things. No, the kind of slavery that you know of is never condoned in the Bible. Okay? Now we're back. Verse 26, at this the servant fell face down before him and said, be patient with me and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him and forgave him the loan. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him and said, pay what you owe. At this his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. 
When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgive his brother or sister from your heart. And it was a long passage, but what it ha- what, see what had happened was the master had a servant that owed him. And he, he fell on the ground and said, forgive me, I'm doing my best. I'll get you this money as soon as I can, but I don't have it right now. And he got mad at him, and he just kept pleading with him. He said, you know what, okay, I will forgive you the debt. That very man who was forgiven went and found someone who owed him, but would not forgive them their debt. That was smaller than the debt he owed his master. And he would not forgive it. And he took complete retribution. What do you think the example is? This is God having forgiven us our debt, and then we turn around to our brothers and sisters who owe far less than what we owe to God, and we take complete retribution, although we were given complete forgiveness. And so, really what this looks like, um, this is Kate. Kate, will you stand up and just turn around and wave to everybody? She's like, oh gosh, I love being a pastor's child. Okay, you can, you can sit down. This is Kate. And uh, so when, when Kate was very little, uh, we adopted a little boy who is, of all my four kids, strangely, uh, the closest two in age are Kate and Bodie. And so it wasn't, we didn't plan it that way, but God did. And man, it just worked out awesome. But Kate was little and Bodie came in and uh, we, we adopted Bodie from Poland. And Bodhi was born very premature. Uh, in fact, he, w- he had to be fed every 20 minutes with an eyedropper, which he asked me the other day, why did they feed me eyedrops? So uh, he was a little guy. I mean, li- like palm of your hand. He was a little guy. And so when we brought him in, he had grown up in a foster home and uh, hit wonderful foster home. I mean, these are fantastic people. Uh, they, were, they were Catholics, so they were Christians. They were huge followers of Jesus. They were wonderful people, but still, it was a foster home. There was a lot of kids, and Bodhi learned how to fend for himself, and so that dude would bite, right? He knew he was the little guy, but he had something that maybe not all the other kids had. He had some chompers on him. Like, he, he would bite, and so um, when the kids were playing, they were a little older, so they had some grace with Bodhi because he didn't speak English. So if he grabbed one of their toys, it was like, we really don't know how to communicate with this dude. But then we had another child, Tinley. And so Tinley is two years younger than Bodhi, and she came along and started grabbing Bodhi's toys, and guess what he did? He bit the crap out of her. And so we had, we had these girls who, who he was coming in and just ransacking their stuff, right? And I'm sitting here watching this like, oh, this little guy. And I'm telling you, y'all, y'all, y'all see my son and you're like, oh, he's all smiles. He's so cute. He put us through hell, okay? <laughs> but I'm watching this with much more wisdom than what these children have. And I see them playing nice with him, thinking maybe, you know, he doesn't understand. And, and him taking that forgiveness and turn around and just making everyone bleed. And I wonder if that's not the way God sees us. And we have to have the perspective that we are a forgiven people because there is not one sinless, righteous person in this building. There is not one sinless, righteous person in this city. In fact, there's only ever been one that existed. And way outside of justice, he gave his life for you so that you wouldn't face that retribution and you wouldn't face God's wrath. 
And we receive that mercy and give vengeance. It's not ours to give. Ecclesiastes 7.21. You ready for this? Don't pay attention to everything people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. For in your heart, you know many times you yourself have cursed others. <laughs> How many times has that happened to you? You will never believe what she said about me. The exact same thing you've said about 25 other people this week. So yeah, I'll believe it. <laughs> You won't believe what he did. The same thing you did? Yeah, actually, I believe that. Proverbs 27, 6. The wounds of a friend are trustworthy, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive. Everyone who curses you is not trying to curse you. Sometimes we're battling against the people who have our back. But that's all good. That's all well. And we know how to play nice, Pastor. But you don't understand things are really, really bad. It's more complicated than that. Sweet. Let's get into that. First John 1 John 1.9. Maybe it's bad, and maybe you have a part in that. And you know you have a part in that. First John 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you will confess your sins, you have the forgiveness of Jesus, whether or not you have the forgiveness of someone else, and that should mean a lot to you. If I have the forgiveness of Jesus, I can look myself in the mirror. I can keep going, and I know that all of us in here have worked really hard to destroy someone's life before, and we have regret, and you need to make those apologies, but the first thing you need to do is confess it to the Lord. He's the forgiveness I need. I can live without anyone else's forgiveness but not His. I've got to have His. And He gives it. We just have to humble ourselves enough to confess. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. So if you're offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister. Then come and offer your gift. So God's like, you're going to wrong somebody and then you're going to come and, and play religious? Nah, -uh. <laughs> No, 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 no. I look inward. I look at the heart. You get yourself up, okay? And you go confess what you have done to someone. You go say your I'm sorry to someone and then you can come back and we'll talk. <laughs> Before that, I ain't talking to you. I've got to confess. But, Pastor, it isn't my fault. And many of you have that story. You have played the victim. Not in everything. But in this situation that we're thinking of, not the 150 others, it's not my fault. Normally, normally, in your conflict, and I, I need you to understand this, and, and I, I would get amens from this from non-Christians. Whoever you are in conflict with has a version of the same story that you're telling, and it sounds nothing like yours. They hate me, and I don't know why. Really? Like you have no idea why? There's probably something in there. Listen, there are people out there who hate me, and I don't think they're justified in their hatred. But I know why. <laughs> Let's not pretend like I don't know why. If it isn't your fault, and, and yes, you've, man, you've been a victim on some stuff, and I sympathize with you on that. I'm not trying to be facetious on, on everything here. I, I really, I, I sympathize. You, some of you have had a horrible hand dealt to you in a lot of situations. And and, and I've got some scripture that we're going to talk about. But one thing that I need you to understand is the world's definition of forgiveness uh, is not always God's definition of forgiveness. Um, I have a friend who has done something I don't know if I would be able to do. She 
was uh, raped by her stepfather for all of her teenage years. And it was very traumatizing to her. And until she was able to, to grow, get out of the house, and feel secure enough and safe enough and distant enough, uh, she never told a soul. And when she did, she had a boyfriend that is now her husband and she thought would have her back. She turned this man in and he is now in prison. She got a lot of advice about forgiveness and how, oh, his family members were calling up left and right. No, you can't, you can't file on him. You, you can't do this because that's not what forgiveness is. Let me ask you a question. Does God forgive? Yeah. Does God punish? Yeah. So can the two coexist? <laughs> Every day. She had an obligation uh, that this would not happen to other girls. And so she had to follow through with that. And along this journey, it was a very difficult journey for her, she forgave this man. This is another thing that I have no business asking of anyone. She got this completely from the Scripture, and she found it in her heart to do for him what Jesus had done for her, and she forgave him. And he's in prison. So the world's definition, okay, be careful. Make sure that you're getting your definitions and your understandings from the Word of God, not from somebody who has an agenda over your life. Is, is, that, is that helpful? So with the Scriptures that I'm going to say, understand that God is the ultimate Father, and He is ultimate in forgiving, and He also punishes Luke 6, 27, but I say to you who listen, love your enemies, do what is good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Sounds like a sick joke, doesn't it? It will be the most therapeutic thing you'll ever do. And some of you have had, had to live that, and you know what I'm saying is real. And some of you are looking at me like, you have no business asking, I'm just, I'm just reading you scripture. <laughs> I'm not asking this. The Lord is asking this, and this is one of the most therapeutic things you will ever do in your life. If anyone hits you on the cheek, offer the other also. And if anyone takes away your coat, don't hold back your shirt either. Give to everyone who asks you, and from someone who takes your things, don't ask for them back. And I never saw John Wayne do this. But John Wayne didn't pave my way to heaven. Jesus did this, and if you follow his teachings, they will bring peace to your life. On the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm sorry, but if you drive nails through my hands, we've got problems, and we probably will for years, much less that day forgiving you. If you rep the flesh off of my back, I'm probably going to be a little salty about it. That day, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Romans 12, 17 through 19, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, because that doesn't sound like, that doesn't sound like my life motto. I don't care what people think about me. And honestly, I, I kind of like, like that attitude. But hopefully this is what you mean when you say that. People's opinion about me will not make me do what I find wrong. Is that better? Your opinion about me will not make me abandon my principles. It doesn't sound tough. But hopefully that's what you mean. Because as an ambassador of Jesus... I have to care what people think about me. I have to use kindness. Right? There are some things that, that maybe, maybe I don't feel it today, but I know this is the way that I act as an ambassador of Jesus. 
And so in that sense, yes, I do care what people think about me. So I get what you're saying when you say that. I'm not condemning anybody if you've ever said, I don't care what people think about me. Like, I know what you mean. But are we still on it? Romans 12, 17 through 19. Here we go. Yeah. It, Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Verse 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. This is where our theology gets shady because we go, well, I tried, it is not possible. <laughs> if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do you see that phrase? As far as it depends on you. I'm going to live in peace. Sometimes it doesn't depend on you. Okay? I, I think that, well, let me take my opinion out of it. You are allowed to defend your family. Okay? Because at the point that you're having to defend someone, that's not really on you. Does that make sense? See, it says, live at peace with every, uh, if, it, if possible, as far as it depends on you. So, like, it's no longer on me when there's attack. So if someone tries to steal your child and I allow them and I'm like, listen, it was just easier to have peace in that moment. No. <laughs> it's not on me at that moment. Defend. Okay. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. You just said we can defend our family. Yeah, I did. That's different than uh, avenging yourself. Fighting for your pride <laughs> is not avenging yourself. I, I'm sorry, is not defending your family. Fighting your, for your pride is avenging yourself. Okay? Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. Restoration is our goal, not revenge. Revenge does not belong to us as Christians. Again, not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts I do understand. Because a little revenge sounds good. Right? You know, in the King James, it said, says, Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. And there's an old joke. Vengeance is fine, thus saith the Lord. No. No, no, no. Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. I know that this wasn't on... Whatever, I don't know. I don't even know what the religious channels are called anymore. But do you understand that God has your back? That you don't have to take revenge on people uh, because God has set things in motion to where if you bless His people, you're blessed, and if you curse His people, you're cursed. It's a theme following all the way from Genesis through Revelation. So we don't have to concern ourselves with it. He's taking care of it. What is the end goal? Restoration. Why? Because that was God's goal for you. If it weren't, who would be left standing? Certainly not I. Let me give you a couple little nuggets here. Worship team, you can go ahead and come up, please. Philippians 2, 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interest of others. Does that include people that I'm in conflict with? That may be why you're in conflict. Like when we were in elementary on the playground, we couldn't see it, but now our kids come home and, and you hopefully, as a Christian, you go, oh, I know why this is happening. I know it's their home life. I know that this child is being abused. I know that, but we don't see it when we're in it, right? So if my goal is restoration, I begin to see those things and I don't have to fight for my pride because I know it's not my pride I'm fighting for. It's some conflict in your life that I have received the blunt. I've received the butt of this conflict. And so I pray for you. I work to restore you. Proverbs 17, 14. To start a conflict is to release a flood, stop the 
so, I'm sorry, stop the dispute before it breaks out. I'm going to read that one again. To start a conflict is to release a flood. Stop the dispute before it breaks out. Let me give you a little trick. Somebody showed me this years ago. J.D., would you hand me my phone, please? Um, I have used this often. You're going to say, wow, pastor, this sounds like a real jerk move. No, this is stopping a dispute before it breaks out. And I have done this to many people, including other ministers. Well, we've heard that you did this. I know that you thought this, that you did this, that you told him, that you told her. One swift move. Let's call. Right now. Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's call. And you will start seeing the backtrack. Stop the dispute before it breaks out. D listen. Confronting someone with conflict, if you do it in humility, should not be an offensive thing. Okay? If you let it go, and you let it go, and you let it go, it is, what is that? <laughs> like the release of a flood? It's like the dam breaking. And so, literally... It should, it should almost just be offensive to you if people come to you bad-mouthing others. Whoa, don't you know? Don't you know that I'm a man of peace? Don't you know that we're going to get to the bottom of this? And we whip this out and we say, let's call right now. I never did that. That didn't happen. That's not true. Who told you that? We'll call them right now and clear it all up. And then you'll probably find out no one really ever told them that. I'm telling you, I don't know that it's ever failed me. So, why is this something we're talking about today? Because you have work to do for the kingdom of God. And the world wants this for you. The world wants you to deal with conflict in this way. You wronged me, you're dead to me. And that's the easy way out for a little while until you find yourself all alone. And maybe you've been there. Maybe you are there. Maybe you have people in your life who are so quick to go, you're dead to me, that they have found themselves all alone. At which point, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine in a world where no one lives and no one will see it. God has put us here for a reason. He has a purpose for your life and I don't want you to be so bogged down in conflict that people can't see what God is doing in your life because He's doing some really cool things in your life. And if not, we urge you. Uh, hopefully you wrote down some of these scriptures and you'll go and you'll begin to read them and, to, and, and put them into your own life. But your life will be a magnet to people because they will think, man, they just thrive. There's just peace here. And I want that. If you've lived without peace before, you'll want nothing more. And this will help you live peaceful and do what God has put you here to do. Because Satan will keep you so bound up in conflict that you'll never do any of it as long as you'll allow him. And that's why this is an enormous monster. Because we have enough distractions in this world as it is. Please don't get bogged down in conflict. If you will deal with it biblically, then first off, if no one else gives you forgiveness, you will have his. And you can live with that. But man, you will begin to be the one who restores. And that's what I want for you. I think that's what you want for you. So, Lord, we pray that you will be in us, that you be with us, Father, that you will lead us to a heart of forgiveness and humility and help us, Lord, to live at peace with others, so much so, Lord, that it is magnetizing uh, to the world and they want to know how we have so much peace. And we tell them it's because of you. Thank you for your forgiveness, God. Thank you that you didn't seek vengeance, that you didn't seek retribution on our many sins and help us to be more like you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
The worship team's going to play a song. Uh, baskets are going to come up. And so part of the way that we worship is with our tithe and offering. But also, if you put that connection card in there, let us know what, what you're going through, how we can pray for you. Um, and, and anything that you want to let us know, please fill that out. Put it in the basket. Better yet, stick around after service and visit with us. We would love nothing more. Please stand and worship.